Uh, hi, um, please welcome back Oliver Austin. Uh, Oliver is participating in the second year of the TED conference and uh, where he continues to look at the roles of typography as it relates to airplanes, airports, and other things that fly. Um, Oliver will be attending UC Davis as an undergrad and is part of this silo that I mentioned to you of um, Oak Ridge High School in San Jose, uh, mentored by Jennifer Claudio. Um, Oliver, thanks very much for joining us and uh, have the floor. Okay, thank you for having me. So this year, like Paul said, is my second year. I'm doing somewhat of a continuation for my project last year. Last year, I looked at fonts and typography on runways. This year, I'm looking at typography just around the airport in general. So I titled it, Looking Outside the Cockpit, an in-depth look at airport signage. So first, a little bit about me. Paul kind of said a bit. Uh, I was born and raised in San Jose, California. Um, I went to Oak Grove High School, just graduated this past year. Um, and I'm going to be attending UC Davis in the fall. It, and I'm doing an undergrad uh, in aerospace science and engineering. I'm also a student pilot at Sundance Flying Club. So along with all my interest in aviation, I'm a pilot as well. And then if anybody recognizes this, this is Miniature Wonderland in Germany. They have a model airport there. So I visited that this, like a couple of weeks ago. So continuing passion of aviation. So about my talk today, a bit of discussion overview. Uh, I'm going to be touching on three main points. Uh, the types of signage found on taxiways and the ramp and apron. Uh, correlations between character and sign design choices and their intended usages, and the importance of introduction of autonomous aircraft into, uh, and yeah, just into airports and all the, these signs and stuff. So, but first, as most of you probably don't know much about an airport, a little crash course. What are the taxiways and where's the ramp? So here's a little map here, and it's called a taxi to aerogram. It's what us pilots use to navigate around on an airport. Um, I've put it added in color to make it easier to see, but the green indicates the runways. So this is San Jose Airport. So we have two runways here. Uh, then yellow indicates the taxiways. So taxiways connect the ramp to the runways. And then red indicates the ramp, but I call it ramp because that's kind of a general term for it. The officially recognized term is apron. Fun fact, uh, ramp comes from seaplane days where seaplanes would physically drive up a ramp to get to the terminal. So people just use ramp uh, synonymously with uh, apron. But this is kind of what I'm talking about when I talk about taxiways and ramps. And then if looking out the window, because sometimes top down is hard to visualize, this is actually at Marseille Airport in France. Um, here's the runway right here. And we have a taxiway that goes all the way back to the terminal area over here. And next to the terminal is the ramp. So a quick look at airport signs. Uh, I don't expect anybody to read all of this. It's a bunch of text. But the FAA, or Federal Aviation Administration in America, has a documents where they've listed all the different types of signs that you can find around a taxiway. We have three main categories of uh, white on red, black on or yellow on black, and black on yellow. Basically, they go in order of priority from uh, white on red to black on yellow to uh, yellow on black. So uh, of course, red is important. Uh, these are used around runways and ILS is a thing in aviation. Don't need to explain that right now. But basically red important, these slightly less important, but still important. And there's some examples here of these signs at airports. So this is San Jose Airport. This is actually in Heathrow. There's a little sign down here. Um, and yes, that's Concord. Um, and then here's a fly enabling. There's noise abatement. Basically, uh, there's rules to not disturb the civilians on the ground. And then, so here's a look at signage around the ramp and apron. Uh, we have various things from fuel trucks to the planes themselves to equipment that's used. And you can see they all come in various aspects of colors and fonts and yeah, pretty much anything you can imagine sign wise. You can find it in an airport. So now that poses the question, why do these signs look the way they do? And so I'm going to go through comparing these uh, font designs, 
and then same usages and locations. First, we're going to take a look at taxway signage. So like I said, we have the three main categories. We have white on red, we have yellow on black, and we have black on yellow. Uh, white on red is used to protect runways and areas of importance, and thus it's, they're red because red is a universal color of stop. And also is quite vibrant and stands out from all the other colors. So if you happen to look at a sign, you're more likely to see the red one first. Next one, yellow on black indicates the current location or taxway that you're on. So if you see it, that's where you're at. Uh, and it contrasts against the other combination. So it kind of hides in the background, but still visible. Black on yellow is used to show intersecting taxiways and display general information. And because there's more yellow than black on it, and yellow is a bright color, it becomes a more noticeable sign. And so these are the taxiway science standards as published by the FAA. Uh, they publish them in an advisory circular, or circular, which basically is not necessarily rule by law, but it's more of a recommendation of what they should look like. So you'll see a lot of these around, but there's not a 100% chance you'll see them exactly like they are stated. Um, you can see here a sample of some letters on a grid. So everything has to be done by grid. Here's some symbols, a dot, an arrow, and a dash. Here, up here, you can see sign dimensions and uh, what they should look like, uh, how high above the ground they should be, how long they should be, etc. Down here is distance between letters. So I get very specific with distance between letters. You can, there's columns of columns, depending on what letters before or after. Like, okay, you have to have them certain distance apart. And here, I found this kind of funny. This is how to draw an M with an outline. This is what happens when you give engineers the assignment to uh, show how to draw a letter. They, they give you an engineering diagram of how to draw a letter. Um, yeah, so these are the standards. Don't expect anybody to memorize or read all of them, but these are out here, public documents, like 20 page document or something. Now taking a look at ramp signage, I split these into three categories. Unlike the uh, taxiway signage, these are more, these are my own classes of, uh, of my own categories. So I've separated them into cautionary, instructions, and general information. Cautionary, you just tend to see have more reds, yellows, and bright colors associated with them. And as for font characteristics, they're usually geometric, humanistic, or monospaced. The instructions you see in dollar colors, so blacks and whites, and sometimes you see them highlighted with reds. And in comparison to general information, they're larger characters, so they're more visible. And with these, you see uh, geometric and monospace, but you also see some neo-grotesque as well. And in general information, you normally see white on a dull background or black on a white background. So these kind of like, you don't need to read them all if you see them, uh, so they're not going to pop out at you. And these are usually in neo-grotesque and or human, uh, humanistic uh, styles. So. Here's an example, or here's some examples of cautionary signs that are more for general equipment. So these are things that are found anywhere like on vehicles or ground power units, jet bridges, etc. So you can see some that like watch your head, uh, caution, low limits, that kind of stuff. They're all bright colors with large text, uh, very geometric, uh, and like I said, geometric, human, humanistic, and non-spaced. But you can see they all look somewhat similar, even though there are some big differences between them. Now looking at aircraft-specific cautionary signs, these are signs that can be found on the aircraft for ground staff. Um, you can see a lot of these uh, whites on red, or red on white, sorry. And you do see some white on red, but the key difference between these and the other signs, is these are usually stenciled because they're put on during the painting process of the aircraft. But you still can see some patterns uh, with the uh, that correlate with the other cautionary signs. There's still some geometric uh, ones, there's humanistic ones, and there's monospaced ones. As for instructional signs, these are either on planes or ground equipment alike. Uh, you can see they're a lot duller in color. Like, okay, aside from the fire extinguisher, fire extinguisher is red, but. Um, they're usually black, white, and sometimes highlighted around them. Uh, and then 
like I said, you can see a bit more variety in what fonts are used. You can see some neo-grotesque. Uh, there's geometric and there's model spaced again. Um, some examples here, this is, for example, instructions how to open an aircraft door. This is uh, instructions to open a cargo door. And this is on a jack to jack up the airplane. So quite a large variety here. And then last, we have the general information signs. Uh, these are pretty much anything else that uh, you can find around. Uh, like I said, they just give you information. You normally see them white on a dull background or black on a white or gray background. These are usually also neo-grotesque or humanistic. Sometimes they vary depending on the aircraft and how they were painted. Uh, again, these are very similar to the other fonts, so stencil and that kind of stuff. Um, but for example, these are things on the plane. These are cargo loading specifications. Uh, this is uh, wheel pressure instructions, how uh, much pressure the wheel holds in a plane. Uh, external power, uh, door latch again, just a random sign around the airport, a switch. And these are my favorite ones. Live animals, okay, in this compartment. And live animals conditionally accepted in this compartment. So that's inside the plane. Now the question is, why does this all matter? Um, and it's mainly, in my eyes, the onset of autonomous aircraft in aviation, such as this plane down here, which is the uh, Airbus A350-1000 series, which is their first uh, autonomous plane. So for those who weren't here last year when I gave my presentation, uh, a little rundown of how autonomous vehicles work. Uh, what we're tackling right now, or what I'm tackling, is uh, vision-based navigation systems. So they use cameras and computers, where the computers look through the camera feed and try and analyze it and find objects or patterns, etc. cetera. Um, use of cameras, you can have a lot higher precision. There's, there's technologies that have higher precision than cameras, but cameras in this case, uh, when you're trying to read text, it's the only thing you can really use. Um, and the most prevalent use, if anybody's seen like Tesla's or autonomous cars, those have cameras that do pretty much the same thing as the cameras in these planes. Um, and so here you can see an example of uh, Airbus's Wayfinder. Uh, they partnered with uh, A cubed. This is in a simulator, I think, judging by how it looks. But this is kind of what the camera does. It will go along, outline the runway, outline the, this is the uh, runway threshold down here. It will outline the center line, and then these are the aiming points where the plane wants to land, or the computer wants to land the plane. But as you can see, the numbers aren't really shown here, so I'm not sure if that's just for artistic style or if it doesn't actually show, but yeah, I'll talk a bit about that in a second, though. This is another one of Airbus's projects, uh, Project Vertex. Um, they, this is, instead of it being a plane, it's a helicopter, and their key is it will be used to put in VTOLs or vehicle takeoff and landing vehicles. These are what you've probably heard of air taxis. Air taxis are planned to be vehicle takeoff and landing vehicles. So this is the kind of technology you see in air taxis. Um, you have cameras again, uh, and you have a bunch of, you have a couple of other sensors. So infrared camera and LiDAR sensor. LiDAR is basically a laser. Um, and then you have the computer. Uh, so CPU, sensor proce uh, central processing unit, avionics, fly-by-wire, he helicopter, basic stuff in an aircraft. Um, you normally don't see high-power CPU, but uh, you also do have the fly-by-wire option and power interfaces. So then it makes it more like driving a car rather than actually flying a helicopter. Um, so it just simplifies it down. But this was back in April 2021. So fairly recent. And then this is what I said we're going to take a look at after. Uh, well, yeah, but, but this is uh, part of my presentation from last year, uh, where I ran machine learning trials on the fonts used for runways. And the data for that showed that the current font significantly underperforms in recognition tests in comparison to the 30 other fonts I trained it against. And it raises the question as to how well the other airport fonts may compare. Although I didn't have enough time uh, this time this year to do any machine learning project side of it, I did. Uh, pull up some stuff from last year and compared it to the taxiway fonts. This font set here, uh, Lumi, was the highest performing font out of that training set from last year. And this is the taxiway font. And as you can see, there are quite a few similarities between them, especially in like the two and three and four. They look very similar to the twos, threes, and fours found in taxiway signs. 
So it shows a lot of promise on that front compared to uh, how the font from last year turned out. But that, that might be a project for next year. We'll, we'll see about that. Anyway, that concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. Uh, if anybody wants to contact me, I put my email here and my Facebook and Instagram here. And a lot of these photos were actually provided to me by one of my friends, Justin Kim, who works as a ramp agent. And so he was able to get a lot of the photos. You can't find any of these on Google, really. So big help and big thanks to him. So I guess now I will take questions if there are any. Yeah, I'm not sure. We don't have YouTube up, so somebody wants to read from YouTube too. Maybe Polo took a took a break, so I will uh, transition. Uh, that was that's really really, really interesting. Um, but for example, for the for all the signs that are uh, on the on the runway and everything. Uh, can it can it be replaced by something else than just uh, uh, cameras uh, reading them? So, yeah, in most systems you have multiple instruments uh, helping fly the plane. So you have lidar system, which basically is a laser that scans out, but that creates a three D map of the terrain, so it can't really read like a two D image. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure if there's any other technology that can read text or 2D surface rather than camera. So I, I don't know at all for small planes, but for big planes and big airports, uh, you can land whatever the, are the light condition and weather conditions. Huh? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You don't see anything. Huh? So, yeah. So in that case, uh, that's the ILS system. Um, it's another system that guides the plane down. But in this case, you can use that for autonomous uh, flight. but once you get close to the ground for actually landing the plane, it's not as accurate, I don't think. It's accurate when you're descending down, mm, but okay. I, I'm not entirely sure about like when you get down. I just remember it. there's better ways to do it when you get down to the ground. So. Okay. And probably also for small planes and small airports, uh, nothing of that is available. Uh, yeah, nothing's available at small. Or well, some small airports have an ILS system, uh, but most of them don't have that system, so it, it would have to be cameras or something like that looking at the runway itself. Okay. And it's really nice to show all the gallery of uh, text, uh, the picture taken all over the place, uh, inside the planes, outside the planes. And, and I think now, next time I will take a plane or even a train, um, I will uh, have a different view on all of that. Um. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions? Oh, there's one in here. Uh, do you foresee the cautionary slash instructional signs at the ramp to be read by autonomous vehicles? Uh, so those signs were just, I was looking at those um, more just in the analysis side of it. The ones that would be read by autonomous vehicles are more what you see on taxiways. There's some stuff at the ramp that you would potentially want the planes to be able to read. There's gate numbers and that kind of stuff that I didn't show here. Um, but all those other signs, it would be interesting to see like whether or not machine could read them, but I guess that would be if you had autonomous vehicles on the ground assisting the plane, but that was more focused for autonomous stuff on the taxiways. I was going to mention that, but yeah. Oliver. Yeah. Have you ever heard of, um, I wanted to ask you this question since the last, since your last lecture, uh, <laughs> of, um, a guy they gave a talk to tech, you might have heard this from Jennifer, uh, in Toronto in uh, 2016 about the uh, freeway signage. Have you ever heard of that? Maybe, maybe. Uh -huh. it, 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 if you get interested, I'll send you the link to his paper. He published a paper on that boat, um, uh, the Tech Users Group Journal, right. about, uh, he gave a talk and uh, it was my first time seeing how typography is important in signage. And, and after that, he took us to a tour 
of the Toronto uh, subway. Oh, yeah. okay. So there, it was about signage on the freeway, on on the subway. Sorry, and uh, and I and why they have developed choices around the Vatica because of uh, speed of recognition, people changing trains or people making fast decisions about if they're going to get into a train or not, or or if this is the correct train or not, and uh, and how. Um, it was positioned and designed. It was an eye opener, and and his article on Tugboat is very very nice. So I'll send you a link for that if you yeah. wanna. Okay, yeah, yeah, that'd be a nice read. Yeah. Uh, cool. I think this opens a very interesting question, uh, which we don't know answer yet, and this is this. We uh, can design a font for signage, which is well read, uh, which is well read by people. We can design fonts and signage, which would be well read by computers. And uh, a good question is whether they uh, would be the same font. Uh, the obvious, uh, the immediate answer is not necessarily because we know a lot of uh, fonts designed for computers to read. Like if you, if you're old fashioned and use a checkbook, then uh, the font on your check is uh, is designed for computers rather than people, and it looks rather un uh, ugly. And I don't know how readable it is. But obviously, it's for old fashioned computers. New machine learning is completely different. So, a very good question is Is it possible to design a font which would be completely, which would be well recognized by people and by properly trained computers? Hey, that sounds like a topic idea for maybe next year's or two years down the yeah. line. We'll see. Yeah, we'll yeah. see. It's, <laughs> it's a very interesting topic. Yeah. yeah. And it might give us something some insight about our human recognition of letter forms, if we understand how and why computers mix them and what, what's wrong with this. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. Well, there are no more questions. Um, thank you very, very much, Oliver. And uh, hope to see you soon again in some future talk. Yeah, thank you for having me. And uh...